Good morning, and welcome to Morning Movie News, where, yeah, Storm Stella didn't really materialize. So I did come to work today. I had to walk through hail to get here, which was an interesting and new experience, but I got here. Uh, and Morning Movie News can go on, and it's a good thing that it can, because there's actually a lot happening. All right, so the first story, which actually managed to trend for a little bit yesterday, is that Fetty Alvarez, now that uh, Matt Reeves did take the Batman gig, as you might recall, Ridley Scott and Fetty Alvarez uh, were waiting for him to say no, but he said yes, and so Fetty Alvarez has uh, ended up at Sony. Ooh, that's so scary, although Fetty Alvarez, of course, has specialized in horror movies so far. But he's gonna be working with Sony on the Girl with the Dragon Tattoo sequel, and they did manage to get this trending for a little bit yesterday so that's a very good sign well it's a sign for the people still involved with the film as they've total they're just totally restarting uh, in terms of casting it's they're still calling it a sequel for some reason uh, but I guess because they're not gonna do the origin story anymore the character is gonna be shown in the fourth book the girl in the spider's web which has not been adapted into a movie. As you might recall, one of the problems that the first Girl at the Dragon Tattoo movie that was made in Hollywood faced was that a lot of people watched the Numi Rapace version, uh, which was actually, I watched it. Uh, I actually watched the whole trilogy, I think. It was a long time ago, and they all kind of, you know, melded together. It was a lot like, um, the, 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 the trilogy that Numi Rapace starred in played a lot like a TV show to some degree especially because you could watch all three, like, basically in a row. Uh, and, you know, I think that a lot of people did, at least people who were fans of the book. So I think that ended up hurting uh, the David Fincher version. Also, I don't think uh, Rooney Mara is particularly personable. I don't think she... I know the character, is Elizabeth Salander, is supposed to be a, a cool customer, you know, and awkward, but... She just, I think Rooney Mara doesn't really connect with audiences, as you've seen in every other role she's done since. So the film, and Daniel Craig, of course, uh, uh, infamously co-starred, but neither one is going to be coming back as uh, Fetty Alvarez adapts his fourth book, which is also well known for not being the only adventure uh, written by, uh, you know, for Elizabeth Salander, not written by Steve Larson. Uh, and of course, there's a lot of, um, you know, rumors and conspiracy theories regarding uh, his, his death. So anyway, they've set the release date for this for October 5th, 2018, which is interesting for two reasons. The first is that this is almost, it's the, almost the exact same date as Blade Runner this year. So uh, the first weekend in October is becoming like a prestige blockbuster release date. So uh, Blade Runner 2049 in October this year, and then The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo next year. Although that date's also well known, perhaps, to you, because it's when Aquaman comes out. So Aquaman is going to be going up against The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. I think they're actually pretty well matched. I think that Jason Momoa and Amber Heard and Patrick Wilson kind of bring down uh, Aquaman a little bit. I'm still rooting for Jason Momoa, but I still think it seems like at face, uh, face value until we see a trailer like a little bit of a B movie. I love James Wan, but I think that, you know, I, so the property of Aquaman is well known, and I think people really care a lot about the DCEU, but the cast hurts it. But if the girl at the dragon, or, well, the girl in the spider's web now can have a better cast, a really strong cast, even though their brand's a little bit hurt, I think you're gonna actually have two very well matched pictures. So that's kind of scary for both of them. Uh, also, I think it shows uh, it's not such a great thing for the DCEU, furthermore, and that I think it's like Hollywood maybe smells blood in the water and they're not willing to respect the sanctity of Aquaman's release date. I'd be like, what are you doing, man? Not cool. All right, so as for who they should cast, this, you know, I think this is really going to hurt Rooney Mara's reputation in Hollywood. This was supposed to be her signature role and not to be asked back. That's like one of the, it's, uh, that's like really hard to get over. It's like when Kate Hudson was supposed to win for Almost Famous, the Oscar for Best Supporting Actress, and she didn't. She never really got over that either. I mean, of course she got work. I'm sure many of you are typing that right now, but she, ne she never got the career that an Oscar win would have given her. So I think that Rooney Mara, whose career never really materialized anyway, and that's going to maybe be like the final nail in the coffin, perhaps. I think it's a little bit embarrassing for Daniel Craig. Although, on a side note, maybe Sony, because, you know, Sony's still distributing the Bond movies, at least for the moment. Uh, and maybe they're like, let's, you know, let's cut out his other options. And then that'll even force him even more so to sign on for uh, two more James Bonds because um, he's got nothing else. 
But I actually have a casting suggestion. I don't know if anyone here is watching Billions. I love Billions. It's such a good show. They just uh, renewed it for season three over on Showtime. I used to, let me just put it this way. I used to watch Suits. And then once I discovered Billions, I was like, Suits is, Suits is the baby version. This is for babies. Like, you know, Billions, that's the cool place. So I just love Billions. I feel bad for Suits. It's a great show. But once I watched Billions, there was no going back. It's fabulous. All right, so anyway, a little bit risque. For anybody who's thinking of watching, I gotta just give a little heads up because I know people of, uh, you know, some some uh, tweens and teens watch uh, the show, which I I love that, but I have to be responsible in uh, my recommendations. All right, so anyway, season two features this character who's genderless. She wants to be referred. Well, um, it's an actress, but her char the character uh, wants to be referred to as their, the, you know, them, uh, instead of he or she. But uh, that's just the tip of the iceberg in this character. It's very interesting. It's played by Asia Kate Dillon, who is non-gender in real life. And really compelling. And instantly you connect with uh, the character. Very well done. Very personable. And very interesting. And, uh, you know, I think Elizabeth Salander is supposed to be a little bit more feminine, I think. Uh, but, you know, her character also has experiment, experiments in terms of gender and sexuality. So... I think that with the right styling, Asia Kate Dillon certainly has the personality to really be amazing. So that's actually who I would, would recommend. And she's getting a lot of, the character and the, actri the actor are getting a lot, I'm trying to respect the, the genderless, but it's hard. Okay, I'm, it's, it's new. Okay, so I think that the character and the actor are getting a lot of attention because of such a great performance. And that's the end of the day is the most important. Okay, so that's the first story. The second story of the day is that you might recall that in my review of John Wick Chapter 2, I thought Common did a really good job in the movie. And apparently, so did producer Lorenzo de Bonaventura, because he's getting his own action movie called Quick Draw, <laughs> which is basically John Wick in Los Angeles. And I think it's really fantastic to see him graduate, because I think Common has certainly paid his dues. He's been the side character in a lot of movies, for instance, Run All Night, where he also played an assassin, and I thought he did a good job there, too. Uh, he had like a really stupid role in Suicide Squad, but I, th you know, but again, talk about paying your dues. He was, he did, he did a good job. He he wore the ridiculous. Uh, that was like I think the one costume in the movie that didn't work, and he played out that ridiculous scene. You know, I thought it was actually one of the worst scenes in the movie. But Common, Common was a real team player. He took one for the team, right? So I think this is uh, great, and I'm so happy to see him rewarded for his efforts. So it's not like. It's not like sometimes when someone from a different uh, industry, like music or something, is like, I want to be an actor, and they get to go front of the, they get a front of the line pass. Common has been standing in line for a while, and so he deserves to, you know, it's his, it's his turn to ride in the front, the front seat, the lead role. Now, uh, the only problem is that this is uh, written and directed by Harris Goldberg, who comes from comedy, for instance, and he's been doing it for a long time. Deuce Bigelow, male gigolo. But he wants to reinvent himself because everybody's making action movies these days. You know, John Wick. Uh, we've been talking about it a lot because, you know, Atomic Blonde is coming out. Uh, also one of the John Wick directors. But you've got uh, Taken, The Equalizer, Jack Reacher, all these movies. So why not have one with Common? Uh, you already have The Equalizer in terms of bringing some diversity. But where is The Equalizer 2? They were supposed to make it. But let's, why not try to do Quick Draw? I'm sure this movie is incredibly inexpensive to make. Especially, I mean, they're even shooting in Los Angeles. They're not even bothering to travel anywhere. Uh, and so I, I just hope it pays off for everyone involved. I'll be rooting for it. And I, I'll definitely keep an eye on it. And I'm curious, are you going to keep an eye on it? So then here's the third story of the day. This was very, a very interesting announcement yesterday from MTV. And that their movie awards is going to go Golden Globe style, which means they're going to give out awards for both movies and television. So even more so, before the awards show airs live, they're going to have a movie and TV festival all day long. And the festival attendees can stand alongside the red carpet, like at the zoo, I think, if I were um, an attendee. Uh, to the event of, you know, the celebrities walking on the red carpet. I don't know how I'd feel about that, right? I mean, will someone be standing there? Because they're going to have food at the festival, too. Someone will sit standing there watching you, have your photo taken and do interviews while they eat, right? And then decide they're bored watching you and walk away? That would be so demoralizing. And, of course, there will also be musical acts during the day at the TV and movie festival because it's MTV, right? Which is originally music television. And it's now so far from that. But I do think that MTV doing something for TV 
TV shows is a great idea. The MTV Movie Awards certainly get a lot of attention in the media and with fans. It's, you know, it's something worth covering. I cover it every year. And it awards movies that people like. And now that Twilight and The Hunger Games are out of the mix, it's more awarding films that everybody likes. You know, for a while it was kind of commandeered by a specific fan group. Uh, but now, you know, like for instance last year, I think everybody had a little bit more interest in it. Uh, and also it's very lucrative, obviously, for MTV because they can sell ad space on it. But I think that the MTV Movie Awards show is bloated enough as it is, right? I mean, it goes on for a very long time. There's a lot going on. How long, how on earth are they going to incorporate television in there at the same time? And I don't want them to lose, like, the fun little quirks that are the MTV show, Movie Awards. Like, the sketches that they have. The best sketch to date was uh, the Titani one, where Ben Stiller and Vince Vaughn uh, were pitching James Cameron on a sequel. You know, I guess I like it because I liked the business of Hollywood so much, but it was really funny. And I wish they would do more sketches like that. They always have some fun stuff, though. It's always a good time. Uh, for instance, they infamously had some presenters rip off Zac Efron's, Efron's shirt when he won Best Shirtless Performance. He should have seen that one coming. Uh, and it was kind of weird because it was almost like sexual harassment, and he seemed like he didn't want them to do it, but they did it anyway. And so you were like, only on MTV would this happen. Although Adrian Brody, of course, did uh, kiss uh, Halle Berry when he won his Oscar. So I guess it can happen at any awards show. You know, keep your guard up. Uh, so so anyway, I think that what I would suggest is that MTV do a TV and movie awards show separately. I don't. I think this festival seems stupid to me. I mean, I guess they'll have coverage all day long, like they'll, have, they'll send floating camera crews around. But I think they should just have a separate separate shows for both, and they would double their ad dollars. So that's my thought, and I'm curious, what do you think of it? Do you think it's a good idea for MTV to award TV? And do you think it should be part of the same show as the movies? Or do you think it should be separate? And also, what do you think of this festival? Would you attend the festival? And what do you think of how they're going to handle the red carpet in regards of the festival? All right, so the viewer question. This is actually a really good viewer question. Uh, it came out of, totally out of left field, but it makes perfect sense as a question. So Zachary uh, Feel says, hey, Grace, hope you're staying warm. Question for you. What's the difference between a cinematic universe and a franchise? Oh, I love it. To me, they seem like the same thing, but studios are getting so hung up on setting up cinematic universes. Why is Fantastic Beasts part of the Harry Potter franchise, and why isn't there a Harry Potter cinematic universe? Or HPCU, as Zach says. Is this just a branding thing? Great question. Okay, there is a difference. So a franchise is just one linear story, and you you know you can go forward and you can go backward with prequels like they're doing with Harry Potter, uh, and also like they did with Star Wars originally. We're going to talk about Star Wars in a minute, but a cinematic universe is something that branches out to spin-offs and follows different characters, uh, but everything's connected. You know, it, it, it's almost like again I told you a franchise is a straight line, but you can go anywhere you want on that line. But a cinematic universe is like a tree that starts to like spread out and branch out and you have characters that are that could interact with other characters and other movies in the same cinematic universe but they have their own storyline that's progressing independently right and occasionally it touches back to the main through line where you have crossover movies so that's what a that's the difference between a franchise and a cinematic universe now star wars is interesting because they're starting to do spin-offs like rogue one and obviously the upcoming han solo movie but so far the spin-off stories are one-offs and they only provide perspectives still on that main story they're not really branching off so I don't really think that I would qualify Star Wars still as a cinematic universe they'd have to have like I don't even know if an Obi-Wan series of movies would count as making it a cinematic universe what they'd have to do is take a character like if Poe Dameron decided to go off and have his own adventures and start meeting new characters then you'd start to be building a cinematic universe especially I guess that's one thing with something happening simultaneously two stories at the same time uh, for instance, also if Harry Potter, if they were to make Dumbledore spin-off movies and he were to have his own adventures uh, at the same time as you were watching Newt Scamander's adventures, then that would start to become a cinematic universe. So that's the difference. A line, a straight linear line versus a tree with branches. So that's the difference between a franchise and a cinematic universe. So also like think about Jurassic, the Jurassic movies, for instance. It's still a straight line, right? If you were to take uh, B.D. Wong's character from Jurassic World and have him go off on his own situation where he was doing some nefarious dinosaur stuff with new people at the same time as whatever's happening with Chris Pratt and Bryce Dallas Howard's characters, then it starts to become a cinematic universe, right? Or I guess you could follow different dinosaurs and the experiences that they're having if you want to stick with the Jurassic theme. Uh, but anyway, Zach, that's a great question and I, I hope that clarifies it. And you know, I think 
we all some of us kind of knew the difference but it's it's very helpful to like okay let's actually just put it down on paper so thank you for asking that zach it was a fantastic question all right thank you everybody so much for tuning in that's today's morning movie news please write down below i think today's top three stories zach's viewer question anything you'd like to see covered tomorrow and questions that you might have thanks for watching bye